Decoding Antisemitism on Social Media, Can You Qatar and the Promise of AI, a stellar lineup to discuss the specific nature of online communication and how it has increased antisemitism in the world generally and specifically online. The Centre for Research on Antisemitism in Berlin has collaborated with HTW, also in Berlin, Hate Lab in Cardiff and King's College London to undertake a research project which analyses the frequency, content and linguistic structure of antisemitism on social media and below the line in the comments sections of the mainstream media in the UK, France and Germany. In this LCSCA event, members of the project present their findings from the latest discourse report which assessed the anti-Semitic reactions triggered by recent news stories including Kanye West's tweets and statements and anti-Israel incidents at the 2022 World Cup in Qatar. The participants are Dr Lev Topa from the Centre for Cyber Law and Policy at Haifa University, he moderates, Dr Matthew Bolton, a researcher, lecturer and writer focusing on conceptual history, critical theory, legal theory and anti-Semitism, Professor Helen Mahaljevic, who holds a chair in data science at the Berlin University of Applied Sciences, and Karolina Placinta, who is a linguist and political scientist with an interest in pragmatics, sociolinguistics, and critical discourse analysis. Okay, fantastic. So um, I'm going to start us off uh, with a kind of general introduction to uh, the project, uh, the rationale behind the project, the problem that the, the that decoding antisemitism is uh, struggling with, uh, some of the ways in which we uh, deal with that problem, um, and uh, showing you basically how, how we work on a day-to-day -day basis before handing over to Carolina to talk about some of the results in the latest discourse report that we've published. Um, okay, so uh decoding antisemitism what, what is it that we do on a on a day-to-day -day, uh, basis um basically we spend a lot of time monitoring what's going on in the news what's being published um in mainstream media outlets um and what's being discussed on social media uh in three language communities um english focusing particularly on the uk uh france and germany um and what we're looking for are particular news stories that we think might uh, trigger, is that it, it, to use the term we use, trigger uh, discussions or discourses online um, that might be susceptible uh, to having anti-Semitic comments or statements um, as part of that discussion. Um, once we've identified a discourse trigger, um, we then use a special tool which is able to kind of download um, comment threads from various uh, social media platforms or from newspaper websites um, where people are kind of discussing what's going on. And then we, and then we try and analyze uh, those threads using different approaches drawn from various disciplines, uh, humanities, uh, like linguistics, conceptual history, social sciences, um, and then data science. Um, the, the overall, Arch, overarching aims of the project um, are to try and really understand, basically understand what is out there in terms of anti-Semitic uh, discourse online. Um, uh, we think that there are many ways in which we can approach that. We think we've got a particular method which is able to identify um, certain forms of anti-Semitic statements, um, which uh, other, other methods may struggle uh, to, to, to kind of uh, pick out. Um, and by doing that, we can get a much bigger, a much better kind of picture of um, the actual state of play in terms of how much anti-Semitic uh, discourse and discussion there is there is online. Once we've established that picture, a much more accurate picture, we think, of, of, of what's going on, that will be able to feed into much more effective uh, prevention and counter strategies in terms of dealing with anti-Semitism online. Um, you know, primarily in, in the kind of academic research community for other researchers who are working on this, but also there's a much wider uh, potential usage for it um, in politics, media, 
security services, um, social media companies, all of this kind of stuff, all of these, all of these um, um, organizations um, we think will have some use for some of our research. Um, another aim is to, to contribute to improving AI models, um, their ability to detect antisemitism online. I'm sure we've, you know, all had experiences of um, noticing antisemitism anti on the comments, which are just not recognized. We might report them to social media companies and the social media companies just don't understand the, 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 the ways in which they're antisemitic and AI models in particular um, can struggle picking out some forms of antisemitism because it's such a complex, um, complex, ever shifting um, ideology. Uh, we're currently working up on uh, working on plans for a future project, a follow up project, basically expanding uh, the project as it stands to bring in um, the US, uh, thinking about discourses in the US and the interrelation of discourses in the US with um, discussions in Europe, because obviously, you know, the US has quite an outsized impact on uh, social media, certainly. And so we're, we're trying to expand the project to, to bring in um, analysis of what's going on um, in US uh, centric social media. Another part of the, 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 the follow up project will be thinking about uh, generative AI, um, you know, Lots of people have been talking about this recently. AI, which is capable of creating text and creating images um, of, its, of its own accord, essentially. And what are the implications of that uh, for anti-Semitism um, and anti-Semitic uh, discourse online and how that affects uh, ways in which we can kind of grapple with it or, or challenge it. OK, so just to paint a general picture, um, as I'm sure we're all aware, the internet over the past 10, 15, 20 years has increasingly become the place to go for um, public uh, discussion, political discussion, um, exchanging ideas, exchanging opinions, having arguments. Um, and of course, it's become the major forum for the spread of um, all sorts of ideas, but anti Semitic ideas and concepts as well. Um, and studying internet studies, the study of the internet. It, is, it, it provides a particular challenge. It, 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 it needs a particular approach to uh, studying how communication works online, which is not the same as uh, how communication works offline. Um, you know, there, there, are, there are overlaps, but there's a very distinct way in which uh, discussions, discussions online have, have um, developed over the past 10, 15 years. You have different communicative dynamics and different communicative conditions such as uh, lots of anonym anonymity, people can basically you know, hide their identities, which perhaps gives people more confidence to, to, to say racist and anti-Semitic things and abusive things. You have um, lots of mutual reinforcement where someone might feel more confident to say something uh, anti-Semitic that they might not otherwise when they know they have perhaps another hundred anonymous accounts who are gonna back them up or there's the creation of kind of echo chambers or filter bubbles where certain ideas kind of spread and get intensified um, th through being repeated and bounced back and forth. Um, there's there's pretty much a lack compared with the with the kind of regulation that you get um, of mainstream media about what can and cannot be published. There's there's a distinct lack of that online, especially on social media. Um, you know, social social media companies and governments are kind of behind a long way behind the development. They're trying to catch up in terms of trying to regulate it, but they're, but they're struggling. Um, and all of this means that there are shifting boundaries of what people feel able to say in public. Um, people are willing to say things online that you would imagine they probably wouldn't say face-to-face uh, -face with someone or if their name was attached to it. So. That, that, that presents a certain problem and there are different methods in way uh, different methods in which uh, communication online can be studied um, and one kind of uh, strand of thought um, goes for kind of quantitative quantitative analysis which um, is essentially big numbers right so it's like you you might for example you might go through search millions of tweets or thousands and thousands of posts on, on Facebook or something looking for 
certain words, the frequency of certain words. And in, anti, anti, in terms of anti-Semitism, you might look for, you know, words like Jew or other related words and uh, or abusive words, you know, words that are associated um, that are used to kind of a, a, a abuse Jewish people or abuse Israel, for example. And you might search for those words. And then from that, you can build a model of how many times these words appear in social media um, discourse. Now, the, the advantages of doing these kind of big scale quantitative studies is that they can be quite representative because you're using so much data, you're, you're getting a kind of good uh, broad coverage across the whole of, you know, the whole of the internet really, or the whole of the, the, the site itself. The problem comes when um, you're trying to do much smaller scale uh, analysis and some of the meanings that, that some of the ways in which people might use uh, language online are just not picked up when you're just searching for certain terms because you can use the same term in like like uh, Jewish for example you can use the same term in a, in a positive sense you can use it in a neutral sense and you can use it in a negative or, or, or abusive sense and you don't pick up that kind of uh, contextualized uh, meaning if you're just flagging up how many times a certain word is used. Even a, even a word that you might consider extremely anti-Semitic could be used in a, in a comment online in order to counter or, you know, sarcastically countering someone else who is being anti-Semitic. And so there's a danger that you can create false positives by labeling every tweet or every comment which uses a certain word as anti-Semitic when actually that might not be the case at all. Um, our approach is slightly different. We go for uh, a kind of qualitative analysis. Now, what we try and do here is that we try and get real world authentic data from, from the web um you know real life twitter discussions or facebook discussions or discussions on, on on newspaper websites that people have written themselves so it's not like a survey where you know you might have a survey about whether people believe certain conspiracy theories about jews and they give the answers the problem with those kind of surveys is that people are often uh primed by the question the question might be framed in a certain way that kind of leads to a certain answer or there might be the the, the, the person who's being asked the question might be fully aware that, that actually they couldn't really say what they actually th thought because there's a kind of social sanction against saying something anti-semitic in a in a in an interview situation or whatever online people are often more likely especially if they're anonymous to kind of just write what they think so we can capture that data and then we can analyze it closely we have a team of researchers who, who go through these threads and try and really analyze each comment to try and grasp what is the meaning of uh, this comment? What is actually being said? Um, and we, we do we, we try and analyze it at the level of um, the ideas that are being expressed, but also the kind of language, the linguistic structure that is being used. And th th there are all sorts of different um, linguistic structures which can be used in a, in a comment, which can, depending um, on the content, change, change the meaning. So qualitative analysis allows you to recognize the different ways in which certain terms can be used uh, to produce different meanings. The problem with this kind of analysis is that it's very labor intensive. It takes, it takes a long time. Often we have these huge arguments with you know, three or four of us looking at a single comment, trying to work out it, what is the actual meaning of this? What are they actually saying? And you have to take into account the context, the overall context of the news story itself. You have to take into account the context of the thread, um, what, what's previously been said, and all of these things can take up time. So it's, late, it's very labor intensive which, mean, uh, intensive, which means that you can only do, you know, a few thousand comments. I mean, we've done, we've done quite a few. But compared with a quantitative approach where you can look at millions of tweets, um, it, it, it's much harder to kind of get huge numbers. So that means that the results cannot on their own be classed as socially representative, which is why you need to bring qualitative and quantitative uh, methods together, which is one of the one of the aims of the project. OK, so some of the implicit or coded uh, meanings that you uh, find in um, comments which um, in anti-Semitic comments which we think might not be picked up by other approaches then there's all sorts um, 
so there are things like you might find puns uh, like uh, Schwindler's, uh, Schwindler's List or Zion Nazis, um, Israel comes up all the time. Uh, another one we picked up recently is Isn't Real, which is a which was was, was a new one. Uh, uh, Satan Yahoo, which is a play on Netanyahu's name, uh, and Soros spelt with snakes. These things, these these kind of um, statements or, or terms in 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 comments are obviously extremely anti-Semitic, but they can only really be picked out by qualitative analysis. You have to. You know, it's very difficult for a, a, a kind of, um, especially automated detect detection, to pick up on this kind of thing without, unless it's been um, qualitatively anal analyzed first. Other forms of implicit meaning: you get allusions, uh, references to, you know, East Coast bankers or the lobby, or you know, terms like globalist or NWO. Both of which are actually quite interesting in this context because you could use, you know, not every single person who tweets or writes a comment which includes the term globalist or NWO, uh, that, 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 that doesn't on its own make a comment um, anti-Semitic. So if you were, if you you can't just flag up every time someone says globalist and say this, 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 you know, this comment in anti-Semitic, you need that comment needs to be analyzed. You need to see what other words are surrounding terms like globalist or NWO to understand whether this actually has is is being used in an anti-Semitic way. Um, so again, you need you need you need qualitative analysis to, to be able to do that. Um, one another very common uh, thing we find is implicit Nazi comparisons, comparisons between Jews and the Nazis, or between Israel and the Nazis. Uh, often using allusions, so I did so notions that you know the final solution of the Palestinian question, or the fourth Reich, that Israel is the fourth Reich rising, and. You don't, you know, the, the illusion is not being made directly there. It's not, it's not as easy as saying, you know, Israel is like the Nazis, or Israel is like Nazi Germany, or or, or whatever. It's it's being made in a kind of implicit, uh, elusive way, which again needs a needs qualitative analysis to pick up. Um, you also get indirect speech acts, uh, things like who owns the British media. Again. On its own, that might not be anti-Semitic in certain contexts. In the context, if you take it, the context of the thread or the news story or whatever, um, it very well could be. And of course, there's no mention of, you know, it's a rhetorical question. There's no mention of Jews. There's no mention of, you know, anything anything to do with Jews at all here. But in certain contexts, that could be de a deeply anti-Semitic um, statement. And again, you need you, th th it needs to be qualitatively qualitatively analysed uh, before you can pick up on that anti-Semitic uh, meaning. And then, of course, there are semiotic markers and um, three brackets, which I'm sure we're all very familiar with. Again, that's an interesting one because that 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 arose um, in kind of far right Internet forums as a means of kind of, um, you know, identifying people as Jewish without actually saying this person is a Jew. So it's like a kind of in, in joke or a little secret message for, the, for the, the, the community of those forums. It then spread on social media and then it gets adopted as a kind of counter strategy by people who are seeking to push back against anti-Semitism online. And you see lots of people putting brackets around their own name um, as a kind of show of solidarity and, and, and as a way of kind of um, destroying that kind of uh internal group uh in joke that had been developed on the far right so you cannot flag every comment which has three brackets and say this is anti-semitic because it could very well be used in a way that's trying to counter anti-semitism uh and then of course the uh, icons and emojis which can be used in an anti-semitic way depending on the context and uh and memes um, one very prominent one being the happy merchant meme and I think the happy merchant meme just to look at this briefly is, is quite interesting because you can see how how much it changes over the time over time how much these kind of ideas develop how much anti-semitic ideas are able to shape shift according to different um, news stories according to what's going on in the world so we have one on the left which is a kind of you know that is it, the idea that you know, Jews are in, in control of everything, basically in control of everything from Hollywood to the banking industry, to the media, to, you know, pornography, everything. And then we see again, the same image being used uh, as, as a kind of, you know, uh, COVID conspiracy, anti-vax kind of thing. The idea that 
Jews are somehow behind this kind of con conspiratorial uh, vaccine campaign. And then again, you see the same image being adapted uh, to the situation in Ukraine uh, with uh, Zelensky being kind of portrayed in, in that same way. So you, you can see how these things are constantly evolving and they need uh, qualitative analysis to, to, to continual quality, uh, qualitative analysis to be able to recognize all of these things um, as anti-Semitic. Okay, just very briefly to talk about, you know, how we actually um, analyze uh, the comments. Uh, it's, a, it's a kind of three-step uh, methodology. Uh, qualitative content analysis, followed by supervised machine learning approaches, which is what uh, Helena will be talking about, and then quantitative analysis. Uh, so qualitative, qualitative content analysis, so far we've analysed around 80,000 online comments, it's probably more than that now, we're trying to push it as many as we can. Um, and in order to analyse those comments, we use a programme called MaxQDA. Um, and MaxQDA uh, relies on what's called a, a code system. And uh, together with the, the rest of the team, we have kind of put together a code system which essentially is a list of, I don't know, I think it's about 45 different anti-Semitic concepts or stereotypes or ideas. Um, and they, you know, they range from kind of classic or canonical, or canonical uh, anti-Semitic concepts, the idea of Jewish greed or Jewish evil or Jewish immorality, um, ideas of, you know, Jewish power, Jewish control, um, and then more kind of uh, post-1945 anti-Semitic con concepts around, you know, the Holocaust, Holocaust denial, um, some German-specific conce uh, concepts to do with the kind of rejection of German guilt and ideas that uh, Jews are to blame for the Holocaust in some way. And then we have Israel, a set of Israel-related uh, anti-Semitic uh, concepts. And we use this code system, and I should note that this... Uh, this um, code system, we're currently working on turning it into a book, uh, a kind of lexicon of anti-Semitic concepts, um, which will act, basically act as a reference guide for anybody who, you know, you, you might find a comment online and you're, you're convinced that it's anti-Semitic in some way. This book will hopefully allow you to find out exactly what concept is being expressed um, and uh, and, and, and be able to kind of show why it, why it's anti-Semitic. And we're using a lot of examples, real life examples from the work of the project. And that should be being published early next year, I think. Um, so when we analyze each comment, we try and analyze it on a conceptual level. What is the anti-Semitic comment um, content? What, what concept is being expressed in the comment? Is it about Jewish greed? Is it about Jewish evil? And we also look at it on the linguistic level. Um, what are the linguistic kind of forms or structures that are being used to express the, uh, the concept that we've identified? And obviously that's very easy if it's, you know, Jewish people are very uh, greedy, right? That's a very simple um, statement, but often, as we've already um, seen, there are lots of kind of implicit and quite complex meanings to try and unpick. Um, so we have to analyze it at that level as well. And this is what the program looks like. So you can see on the left-hand side, you have the big list of all the different um, stereotypes and, and concepts that we use. And then on the right-hand side here are, this is a little portion of a, of a Facebook thread, I think. Um, and you can see the way in which we, we try and kind of essentially label we label whether we think it's anti-Semitic or not. We label whether we think it's anti-Semitic in a way that you can pick up immediately. So if the comment was printed on a T-shirt and you saw it, walk, you were walking around somewhere and you saw someone wearing that, that comment on a T-shirt, you could say that's anti-Semitic. Or is it a comment that the anti-Semitism is only um, understandable or graspable in the context of the thread? So we have two different ways of, of doing it. Is it directly? Uh, anti-Semitic is it is it contextually anti-Semitic and then we uh, label it in terms of the the concepts that are being expressed and um, the the linguistic the linguistic structure is it is there a rhetorical question is there um, irony sarcasm are emojis being used um, is there imagery um, are, is there an illusion that kind of thing. And so we, we end up with these threads that are coded, analyzed in this way. And we've done, as I say, we've done 80, 80 90,000 um, comments analyzed like that. Um, once we've 
got that, we've got all the data from online, it's all been kind of analyzed. Uh, we then pass that over um, to the data science team who are working on machine learning approaches. And the idea is that they're able, or they're trying to train the AI to essentially make the same decisions that the expert coders of the team uh, make themselves when we read the comment, right? So can, can we get the AI to take into account um, the, the, the broader context of the, of the thread, um, like uh, elements of, of meaning which you, which you need to grasp from a broader knowledge of what's going on and you can't just get from the text itself. Um, can, can we get the AI to be able to distinguish a comment um, that's using a term um, uh, neutrally or as a means of countering anti-Semitism? Can we get the AI to distinguish that from an anti-Semitic statement? Um, and so that's the task of, that's what we're trying to do with, with the AI element, because that will get, that will allow far more um, anti-Semitic content to be, to be picked up, to be identified, uh, and hopefully to be kind of pushed back against. Um, the third step is that once, uh, if the AI can start picking up some of this more implicit anti-Semitism, then we can then use that to make quite huge quantitative analysis by using, you know, by applying the, the, the algorithm to huge amounts of data, um, we can start picking up patterns, uh, how often, you know, certain words or combinations of words come together. Um, and then hopefully we can get a much more, much more concrete understanding of what's, what's, what's out there. Okay, and there's a kind of image which shows uh, how, how it works. So at the top, you have the raw data, which is the, you know, the, the online threads. Um, they are then uh, put into step one, which is which is a quantitative analysis using the, this code system, the guidebook as, as we call it, which is the thing that's going to be published. Um, we then annotate the data. That data is then fed back into the kind of AI program, the supervised uh, machine learning. Uh, they, they can come up with models. They can then test them on uh, the data. Um, that's already been analyzed and we can see whether it's uh, whether it's able to make the same decisions as um, the, as the coders as the coders would. Uh, once that's been done, that then moves to step three uh, and quantitative analysis and we're able to build statistical models and then you can start feeding raw data into um, into the AI data that hasn't been coded to see whether um, the AI is able to pick up um, pick up the anti-Semitism of there, and then you need to test that against expert coders again. So it's, it's a continual cycle moving from, you know, qualitative analysis done by experts to the AI, to the AI test, testing the AI, that's then checked by the experts and it goes on and on and on. And you have to do it like that because of the way that online speech and online anti-Semitic speech is, is in con continual development. If you, I, uh, if you stopped at a certain point, um, and said, okay, that's enough. We're not going to analyze anymore. In a year's time, you try to use an AI that we've been built on, um, on, on social media discussions from two years previously. I don't think it would pick it up because it would, it would lose a lot of the anti-Semitic comments because the language has changed. Um, the, the, the in-jokes have changed, the memes have changed. So you need a continual kind of process of, uh, of qualitative analysis feeding into the AI and a continual development of the AI. Um, and yes, so we publish um, regular six monthly reports where we talk about certain um, discourse triggers that we've analyzed and uh, the results that we found. Um, and uh, we, we're on the fifth one now. The, the, the previous one, I think, was looking at uh, anti-Semitism in, in terms of discussions around uh, the Russia, uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine. Um, and uh, we've done lots of different things. We've looked at, you know, Corbyn stuff, we've looked at individual cases such as the David Miller case, uh, Bristol University professor. We've looked at kind of COVID-19, the vaccine rollout in Israel, all of these things we've, we've kind of analyzed to, to pick up the different, different forms of anti-Semitic um, speech that, um, that appear there. Um, and now I'm gonna um, hand over to Carolina, who's gonna um, introduce, kind of talk, talk you through some of the results from uh, the fifth discourse report that we published um, a couple of months ago. Uh, thanks, Matt. So as Matt already said, in each of the 
reports. We try to capture recent um, events and uh, reactions to those recent events um, in comment sections. Um, and the one published uh, most recently in April focuses on three such events. The first one is uh, reactions and comment sections to the media reports um, uh, around uh, Kanye West and Semitic statements, and we analyzed that for the UK media and French media. Uh, we then looked at uh, reactions to anti-Semitic incidents at the Football World Cup in Qatar last year, uh, and then um, and we analyzed that for the UK. And uh, we also looked at responses to Israeli elections in November in Germany, uh, in German discourse. Um, and all of all of the three sort of happened uh, in the autumn of last year, so fairly recently. Uh, in total, for that report, we analyzed. Uh, over 7,300 online comments. Um, and crucially, this report also contains a chapter on evaluation of existing tools for uh, the automatic detection of hate speech, which Helena will talk about in a few minutes. Um, but before that, we'd like to talk about uh, two of, of the events um, to give you an idea of, of that qualitative analysis that Matt was talking about earlier with some uh, examples. Uh, so on the next slide, we've got um, some information about the first of them, and that's reactions to Kanye West and Semitic statements in the autumn of 2022. I'm sure a lot of you have heard of Kanye West and his statements. Uh, it was quite broadly reported in the press, also in the UK, of course. Uh, but just in case you haven't, a bit of background. So Kanye West is a, um, is a US musician, rapper, music producer, but also fashion designer, an incredibly recognizable influential figure in the entertainment industry, not just in the US, but also globally um, with millions of fans, millions of followers um, also on his social media. And uh, before the autumn of last year, he had already made some um, far right and anti-Semitic statements. For example, he expressed um, his admiration for Hitler, uh, but it seems that those statements became more radical around October of, of last year. Uh, when he, in a few social media posts, he made direct references to anti-Semitic conspiracy theories and tropes. And we have one example of that on the screen on the right there. Uh, that's a screenshot of his tweet from October of last year. I'm not going to read it out because again, a lot of you might already be familiar with it. And it's just to illustrate kind of the intensity of those uh, tweets of those posts. Uh, for example, the first sentence of it uh, is something that in our classification system that Matt talked about earlier, this is something we would classify as an anti-Semitic death wish, uh, death wish. So quite a strong um, statement overall. Uh, and it was one of the few that he made uh, at that time. Um, I think it, it should perhaps be mentioned that um, Kanye West has been diagnosed with bipolar disorder. And, um, you know, I wouldn't like to stigmatize someone's mental health condition. So perhaps this is a situation where we have to separate the person and his uh, mental health from his words. However, the words are undoubtedly anti-Semitic and um, we have been treating them as such. And, um, and we will see that they have been quite influential, quite, they have triggered quite a lot of anti-Semitism in comment sections as well. Um, so on the next slide, we've got some statistics um, to um, tell us a bit more about the analysis in, in numbers. For this case, we analyzed almost 4,000 comments. Uh, half of that was for the UK, half for France. In the UK sample of that discourse, um, we found that 11% of the comments were anti-Semitic. In France, the number was slightly higher, 14%. But interestingly, the top five anti-Semitic comments, the most, sorry, not comments, concepts, the, the most frequent concepts in those anti-Semitic comments were, were, were fairly similar, uh, as you see on, on the graph, but the, the proportion was, were just slightly different. So for the UK, the, the most common concept was um, taboo of criticism and for France, Jewish power, uh, although we'll, uh, uh, We'll talk about all of them in a moment with some examples. Uh, I should point out that, of course, one comment can contain more than one concept. That's why those percentages don't add up to a to a round hundred percent. Um, and we'll see examples of that as well. And I should also say all of the comments uh, we'll show on screen uh, have been anonymized but are authentic. So they might they have the original spelling and. Um, and we try to pick some that are representative of the type of comment we saw a lot. So they are not you know, unique um, in, in what they convey. Um, and we have the 
first examples of that on the next slide, uh, where we talk about uh, the affirmation of anti-Semitism um, in West's uh, statements. So uh, perhaps the most straightforward type of comment we, we can find is, is just agreement. So very often we'd see comment that just said, uh, yeah, I agree with him, or he's absolutely right, or I support him. And this is a very good example of a comment that outside of that context could have a completely different meaning. And this is something that we wouldn't be able to capture um, uh, with quantitative analysis, as Matt was saying earlier. But if we see a comment agreeing with Kanye West's statement in the comment thread under an article directly reporting those statements, we, we in our classification, we have to um, classify it as anti-Semitic, contextually anti-Semitic, but still anti-Semitic, even though it doesn't reproduce any anti-Semitic stereotypes itself. It just um, affirms um, uh, statements made by someone else. Uh, sometimes those uh, comments uh, are a bit more elaborate, like the first example on screen that says they can't cancel him fast enough, he's speaking too much truth, truth for them, or the second one, they call him anti-Semitic but they don't call him a liar. That, that theme of truth and truthfulness was quite a common one. And then some comments went a bit further and presented Kanye West not just as a truth sayer but um, elevated the, him to a status of a hero, uh, of a sort of a brave fighter for the truth um, and um, and called call him directly a hero or use some kind of um, uh, other way to, to do that, like in the last comment that's, that calls him a misunderstood genius against the thought control. Um, this is an interesting comment as well because it seems to um, kind of conflate the admiration for his artistic achievement, artistic talent, or artistic genius perhaps, with support for his words. So, words. so it's almost as if uh, it doesn't matter exactly what he says, but uh, but it it matters who has said it. And because it's a person with uh, with huge following, and that person is possibly already a fan, they will also support um, that person, whatever he says. And that's something we we have seen in previous cases sometimes too. Uh, Matt has already mentioned, for example, the David Miller case, um, who is also a, a public figure, not on the scale of Kanye West, but but a well-known figure uh, in in the UK, um, in for example, academic or or sort of activist political circles, and um, and similarly, he made statements that were reported um, as anti-Semitic, and and that was quite quite a big story two years ago in the UK, um, and similar um, kind of similar. Um, following um in his um, um in his defense um uh, spoke out spoke out in the comments um again not on the same scale of course um in in, a, in the uk context specifically but we saw some of the same concepts um and one of those concepts we uh, we saw is uh, the next slide which is um taboo of criticism um i already mentioned that was the top um kind of comment uh, sorry, top uh, anti-Semitic concept in, in the UK discourse for this case. Um, taboo of criticism is this idea that uh, criticizing Jews is for some reason not allowed, that people who do it will be silenced. Um, and some comments uh, express it fairly directly, like the first example that says, he was free to say whatever he wanted about George Floyd and whatever else, but the moment he mentioned Jewish people, he's canceled. Um, so fairly straightforward. Um, accusation. Um, and also this comment explicitly mentions Jewish people, but that's not always the case. Um, as Matt said before, there's a variety of strategies that people use to avoid saying Jews or Jewish people um, or Israel, and, and, they, um, and we, we see a few of them here. So in the second, um, um, the second comment, um, the word that is used is Zionist, which we here know is not the same as Jews, but but in the analysis we do, we very often see the word Zionist used as a stand-in for either Jews or Israel or both um, at the same time. The third comment simply uses J with three asterisks instead of Jews. And then the last comment um, is quite interesting too. It says, there are first-class citizens and there are those who are not permitted to look at them or talk about them. So this idea of a taboo is, is expressed at the end there in the second half and not being permitted to 
um, to talk about uh, Jews allegedly. And then the first um, the first part of the comment also contains this idea of, of privilege, of a privileged class of citizens, which is also an anti-Semitic stereotype in our classification. So we have a combination of those two here. And although um, this those strategies appear um, all the time with any almost any um, concept, um, anti-Semitic concept um, that we uh, that we find, uh, it's quite interesting here because it almost um, reinforces the um, the idea um, of not being allowed to say something. So it's almost as if the speakers that avoid saying Jews, it's almost as if they, as if they were saying, well. Um, I, uh, as I've as I've said, you are not allowed to speak directly of them, so that's why I'm saying it indirectly. So it's the linguistic strategy they they choose almost reinforces the concept they are trying to promote in those comments. Um, but as I've mentioned, we see these strategies uh, in other concepts as well. For example, the next one on the next slide, which is uh, Jewish power and influence. Um, this is a very old anti-Semitic stereotype. I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with. Um, examples of it from various places and periods in history. Um, we see it a lot uh, in the context of various events. Um, very often it's in the context of politics. In this case, it was mainly media and finance. However, actually in the examples on screen, uh, it's they're even more general. So the first sentence says they control everything. The second talks about controlling humanity and the last one about wanting to rule over everything. It's a very, very generalized statement. And each of the comments also talks about who is doing the controlling or the ruling. Um, and again, those um, expressions are, the, those references, sorry, are um, indirect. So in the first one, we have they in triple brackets. Matt was talking about that earlier. We, we see that very often across all three languages we analyze. Um, in the second one, we have a reference to the chosen people, which is a fairly transparent cultural reference, we would probably recognize that also outside of the context of this comment thread. So if we took this example out of it, this context, it would probably still be clear. But then the last one is a bit more idiosyncratic and, um, and uh, it talks about being crushed by the same juggernaut. So this idea of force of power is, is conveyed here. And then also a single community. So th this kind of, separates it creates that image of a community um that in the context of this common thread we understand as jewish community as being somehow separate so Jew jews are also being othered um by this comment so again a lot's going on here and the idea of jewish power and influence is quite closely linked to jewish conspiracy which we see next um so this idea on the next slide uh, this idea that um that Jews allegedly not only hold like an inordinate amount of power, but also that they use it to um, instigate events from behind the scenes um, and perhaps even um, trying to put Kanye West in danger. Um, so the first comment again says it quite directly, although again, the reference to Jews is implicit, it's J in inverted commas. And um, it says the J don't like it when you call them out for controlling all the media and the banks. So again, the idea of Jewish power over media and finances. And then the second sentence um, also says they want everyone who isn't J to be fighting with each other, not knowing the reason for all their problems was started by the J. So it's pre pretty straightforward Jewish conspiracy expression. Uh, the second comment achieves that in a much shorter way, mentioning the word puppeteers. Uh, this idea of puppeteers, puppet masters, is a very common verbal but also visual metaphor. Um, again, you might have seen, for example, in anti-Semitic propaganda posters um, from um, 1930s, 40s uh, of last century, but it has sort of um, has been kept alive, unfortunately, um, in a very similar form, also in comment sections. Um, and then the last comment. I think it's perhaps the most interesting here because it's the most innocuous on the surface. Uh, but if we break it down, um, we it kind of reveals this, again, the idea of conspiracy. Uh, it starts with, it's about time people started raising awareness. So again, it's this idea that um, it, it's about time people like Kanye were telling the truth about what's happening. Awareness about what they get up to. So again, they is 
um, implicit, we can only uh, read it as Jews in the context of this um, conversation in this common thread. Uh, <sighs> they get up to that. If you get up to something, that usually means it's something bad, something nefarious. And then, so the masses can revolt against them. Masses tend to revolt, revolt against people in power. So when we put all that together, the image that is revealed by this, um, this painted by, by this comment is that uh, there, there are people in power um, implied as Jews who have bad intentions and people should know about this, but, but people are not aware of it. Um, and then the last um, concept I want to talk about is actually two concepts, but they exist on the same spectrum, so to say. So denial of antisemitism or relativization of antisemitism, in other words, minimizing it, downplaying it in this context, um, downplaying Kanye West's statements. Um, and some of those comments were like the first one where the commenter um, rhetorically asks, how is it antisemitic to point out that Jews control or have power in the media? So it reiterates this idea of power, but then says, well, it's a fact, so it's not antisemitic to point it out. Um, so it denies antisemitism of, of such a statement. And then some of those comments um, sort of flip it because they say, well, it's not Kanye West who's being antisemitic, it's other people who are being racist towards Kanye West. And before we analyze that last comment, I, of course, it should be said that Kanye West as a person of color, especially a very public uh, one, a very well-known one, I'm sure has suffered and um, racism probably before and after he, he, he became famous. Um, also in our analysis, um, in comments countering anti-Semitism, we very often see other hate ideologies being weaponized. So for example, racism or anti-Muslim sentiment or misogyny is often used to to fight anti-Semitism, which is unfortunate. But we should also say that just pointing out someone's anti-Semitic statement is not racist, whether they're you know, black or not. So, so of course, we even with all that, if we just focus on the on the situation, it's um it's not a valid uh, claim. And and um an example of that kind of comment um is the second one on the screen. Uh, that says, look at all the white people in here complaining about a black man having an opinion about rich, corrupt Jewish businessmen, racist AF. So having an opinion, um, and semitism here is framed as, as having an opinion, which of course uh, minimizes the seriousness of antisemitism. And then um, that opinion is about mm -hmm. a Jewish businessmen that, that again hints at that idea of alleged Jewish power in, in the business world. And uh, it's framed as if as, as white people complaining about it, um, which um, is kind of again flipping that against um, other community and uh, to the benefit of Kanye West. So that's it for this case. I'll pass you back on to Matt, um, but um, I'm looking forward to the questions later on. Thank you. And um, sorry, Matt, just before you continue. Um, can I just remind you that we're a bit short in time, so let's um, let's uh, do it briefly for about five or six minutes. Thank you. Sure, no problem. Um, okay, so the second um, uh, discourse trigger we analysed in the uh, discourse reports were anti-Semitic incidents at the Qatar World Cup last year. Um, and I don't know if you if you remember, Morocco uh, did pretty well. Uh, I think they got to the, the semis. And um, often after after their victories in, in the the second round and the quarterfinals, they the, the players brought um, Palestinian flags onto the pitch, and the Palestinian flag was quite central to their celebrations. Um, we saw lots of Palestinian flags in the stadium, fans waving them a lot. It became a kind of theme throughout throughout the World Cup. Um, outside the grounds, um, we saw the Palestinian flag um, uh, over and over again. Um, alongside that, there were various incidents of Israeli journalists who'd gone to Qatar to uh, report on the World Cup, um, being abused by fans, uh, being screamed at, being shouted at, or being shunned, people walking off, people turning their backs on them. Um, there were like four or five, I think, separate incidents, uh, incidents of, of that happening. Um, and so these two elements were, were quite widely discussed on, on social media. Uh, and then we focused on Twitter in particular, and we picked out 10, I think it was, um, tweets from various 
people with fairly big followings, uh, journalists, commentators, um, and we tried to get a good range of them. So we got some tweets from people who were essentially celebrating the fact that you know the Israeli journalists had been uh, shunned or abused, or were, were kind of really you know using the World Cup and the prominence of the Palestinian flag as a way of attack, as a as a kind of reason to attack Israel. Uh, but we also took some tweets from people who were pushing back against it and and you know highlighting the attacks on 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 the Israeli journalists and saying that these were um, uh, incidents of anti-Semitism. Um, hang on, I don't know why that's not working. There we go. Uh, and so uh, the the results are, are across all of those those threads. Um, again, it was around. 10% of comments we, we cluster as um, anti-Semitic. And I, th I think it was true to say that actually we often found more anti-Semitism in responding to the people who were seeking to count, to say, say someone to put a tweet saying that, well, I think this attack on an Israeli journalist is anti-Semitic. You would often find more, I'd find quite a lot of anti-Semitism in responding to that um, tweet. Um, and often you'd, the, the, the same would apply the other way around. And so threads where the, the, the commentator was celebrating the attack on Israeli or whatever, um, you would get lots of people uh, countering that and saying that no, was anti-Semitic. So I think there's a, that, combat, that combative element of social media was quite apparent in, 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 in these cases, I think. Um, in terms of the most common concepts, uh, number one was um, people denying Israel's right to exist or denial of Jewish right to self-determination, as we class it, in various ways. Um, you know, classic kind of the three Ds, delegitimization, uh, demonization, um, and I can't remember what the other one is, but I'm sure you all know. Um, after that, we had there were lots and lots of apartheid analogies uh, describing Israel as an apartheid state. Um, which is which is, I think overall must be one of the most common um, concepts that we see um, online and endlessly, endlessly because I think because it's backed up by lots of kind of um, you know NGOs, um, third sector organisations who use that term explicitly, um, and uh, we we do class in our in our analysis we do class the apartheid analogy as. Um, a form of anti-Semitism. Um, we've uh, Matthias uh, Becker and I have, have and, and Carolina have, have written an article about this, um, uh, which been, is being published uh, soon. Um, after the false analogy, there were ideas of Jewish evil, um, and to code something as Jewish evil or or Israel 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 is evil. It has to be more than you know strong disapproval. It has to be, or even you know describing a particular incident as evil, it has to be a very generalized category, categorization that, that kind of essentializes Israel as essentially evil. Um, and, you know, or the whole notion of a Jewish state as essentially evil, not, not just that, you know, the, the military have done something and that's classed as evil, that, that wouldn't count for us. We have quite a th high threshold for what we class as, as, as an anti-Semitic form of um, an evil attribution. And that was uh, third. And then the last one was uh, deceit, which I find quite interesting. I'll talk about that um, in a minute. So yeah, we found frequent use of the apartheid analogy and the apartheid analogy is often made very directly. It's not really, it's rarely kind of covered up um, in, in implicit form. Occasionally it's made through allusions, um, you know, just make vague references to South Africa or whatever, but often it's just, you know, Israel is an apartheid state. So you can see here, bloodthirsty apartheid state. Uh, in the second one, uh, apartheid analogy is combined with this concept of genocide, the accusation that Israel is committing genocide on the Palestinians, which is another very frequent um, uh, idea that we see expressed. And that notion of you know Israel committing genocide, that is then connected to what we would class as kind of forms of Holocaust relativization, um, the, the idea that, you know, the situation in Gaza or the West Bank is anywhere, you know, comparable to Auschwitz or the Warsaw Ghetto or anything like that. I think that that meaning is carried in a lot of those accusations of Israeli genocide. Uh, this idea of a Zionist echo chamber. Um, and then uh, at the end, there's a direct um, comparison with the Nazis, modern day Nazis, um, but weaker, which is, I think that's, 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 that's 
an interesting qualification there. Um, it can't even be proper Nazis. You know, there's something there's something contempt, contemptuous contemptuous about that. Um, and then we saw other comments call, uh, that that deny Israel's right to exist or, or kind of call Israel's legitimacy into question. Zion Nazi, uh, not Zion Nazi entity. It's not even a state. It's just an entity, um, which is essentially a you know a reproduction or an extension of the of, of the Nazi regime. Uh, Israeli uh, is a limited liability company, I think, and the idea that it's not a state, it's just it's just run for business interests, it's about money, um, it's about greed, uh, not even a country, we see lots of these things. Um, yeah, and yeah, just I, and often we get comments that, you know, just refuse to acknowledge that Israel even exists. You know, it's not a country, it's not a real country, it's not a state, there is no Israel, we, we, see, we see quite a lot of that. So that was quite frequent in this corpus. Um, this idea of uh, Israel being kind of essentially evil, um, you know, wholly, entirely evil of this in a kind of grand, at a grand scale. So hatred of Israelis will come automatically if you're a human being. You know, any human being will look at Israel and hate, hate it. Um, and that if you don't hate Israel, then somehow you don't qualify as a human being. You don't have the kind of moral fiber or rationality of a human being. And so um, all is by, by extension, all Israelis or Israeli supporters or anyone who just doesn't hate Israel is not does not qualify as a human being and is um, su supporting evil, essentially. Uh, the next one, how do you defend killing thousands of children, butchering them in the streets, um, which is a kind of grossly exaggerated um, accusation. You know, we're very careful when, you know, say there's been an incident when the Israeli military have killed a child or something, a, a comment that's talking about that very specifically would not necessarily be coded as anti-Semitic. They get coded as anti-Semitic when it turns into this huge kind of generalized thing where, you know, there's millions of children or thousands of children being killed and it's merciless and, you know, that kind of thing we would code as anti-Semitic. And then again, you have uh, Jews are worse than the Nazis, 21st century Holocaust. So there's a, there's a Nazi, there's a Nazi analogy. There's a comparison between Jews and Nazis. There's Holocaust relativization again. Um, and then these uh, last ones. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Hang on. Uh, that they were responding directly to some of the ideas that, um, that the incidents where the Israeli journalists were kind of um, abused or, or kind of, um, you know, spat on or shunned. Um, and people were saying that these incidents were not actually real or that they'd been kind of instigated by the journalists themselves in order to get that response so that they could then complain about anti-Semitism. And that's connected to kind of ideas of Jewish kind of propensity for lying, for deceit, for instrumentalizing anti-Semitism that we, we, we see quite often. And I found that th those ones I found, um, they were fairly prevalent and I, I found them quite um, uh, it, it, very interesting in, in this context. Okay, um, so now I think I will hand over to Helena and I'll stop sharing my screen um, and then she can take over. I think I was still muted, but I shouldn't be anymore. Okay. Um, can you actually see the slides? Because I can't <laughs> right now. Just give me a second. I'll try once more. No, it doesn't really work. Yeah, right? that's it. That's it. No, I can see it. Uh, but it's not the slideshow, right? So it says towards the automatic detection of anti discourse online. But I guess you see um, all the other slides on the on the side. Or yes. Is it better now? Uh, yeah, yeah, that works. Okay, brilliant. You can't right, see it on your screen. Probably... Sorry. It's not on your screen though. So you don't see the full screen with one. No, no slide. we do. It's good. It's good now. Okay, brilliant. Um, right, so um, 
I probably don't have to motivate anymore why it could be useful to have um, tools that support an automatic detection of um, anti-Semitic um, content, and not only this uh, detection, but also maybe a fine granular classification of what type of anti-Semitic um, content we actually read. Um, Obviously, it's not only relevant for researchers, but also for NGOs who monitor the development uh, on social media platforms um, out there um, that are confronted with um, loads of text, um, racist text, uh, anti-Semitic text, hate speech, and so on on a daily basis. Um, when, here we go. So um, when we talk about automated uh, or automated classification of text and automated detection of certain phenomena, then we are in the field of so-called text classification and the general idea that we apply nowadays to build such models is to use so-called um, supervised machine learning approaches. So supervised basically means that we um, take an algorithm and we show the algorithm data from the past. So we show it um, texts and uh, we show it certain categories that those texts um, belong to in the opinion of experts who have annotated the text um, like uh, Matt and uh, Carolina did, for instance. Um, so basically the algorithms see um, data together with the corresponding labels and we try to teach the algorithm to learn certain textual patterns um, in order to be able to predict on new texts um, what labels are um, the most probable ones. Um, the, the tricky thing is that um, that kind of or that type of algorithms needs a lot of um, label data in order to learn um, in order to learn those textual patterns. And the more complex the textual phenomenon is, um, the more data you need and the more challenging is the classification task itself. Um, the, the way we do this nowadays, uh, which is uh, a lot better than um, a few years ago, is that we use so-called pre-trained large language models. So you might have heard of models like BERT or GPT-3 or GPT-4. So these are um, basically, so what we have is language models that have been trained to solve certain um, general language tasks like given a sequence of words to predict uh, what's the most probable next word to follow in a sequence, which is also what we use um, in order to generate text. So we give like a starting sequence and then it basically keeps generating word by word. Um, and those um, general large language models, they have been trained with um, data from the internet. So basically you can think of like, you know, taking uh, almost the entire internet and feeding it into such models. So um, they have learned already a lot of uh, a lot about um, general uh, language structure. And what we have to do is to, we call it fine tuning. So we fine tune this language model in order to teach it um, what is specific about certain classes of texts like hate speech, anti-Semitic speech, and so on. So this is what we um, uh, typically call downstream tasks. Um, now, there are a couple of challenges with um, text classification, so it sounds uh, kind of nice and easy and uh, you can set it up technically um, in, in a standard way, but um, the, the real challenge with um, this type of text is that um, text from social and online media, they're often very short, you've seen like a lot of examples now in the previous slides, they're not only short, but they are fragmented. They use codes. Um, you have a lot of references to person without naming them uh, explicitly, um, the references to certain named entities without naming them explicitly. Um, there is a lot of um, broader background knowledge that is um, being utilized in order to formulate um, texts in order to be not discovered maybe by content moderation on platforms. So to avoid regulation, uh, people use codes, um, but also to be uh, well understood by peers coming from um, a similar group. Um, so there is a lot of um, implicit statements that are being used in online and social media. Then we have references to other texts that might not be like the previous text in an online um, in like in an online comment section, but might have been the text that appeared um, a couple of steps before. So there are a lot of challenges um, that are um, that, that we face when we try to classify um, text from such sources. Um, you kind of have to think about the fact that when you 
I think it's an interesting challenge um, for everybody. The next time when you when you uh, go to social media and you look at the the comments there, um, and uh, you discover a comment that you find I don't know particularly abusive or um, interesting in in whatever sense, uh, you can try to uh, find out uh, how much um, information is actually uh, formulated explicitly in this um, in this short piece of text. So, um, and we actually see that even um, humans struggle very often, uh, even like experts um, struggle very often with um, producing highly consistent um, annotation for certain concepts such as um, conspiracy theories, for instance, that are very often fragmented um, or hate speech or anti-Semitic speech. Um, Another issue that we are facing is that we, when we train uh, models on certain uh, types of data, for instance, we, we train it on data from Twitter, it might be that it doesn't really perform well on um, data from Telegram because the um, way language is used is different, or it might not perform very well if we apply it to, I don't know, we, we trained a model before COVID and then we apply it to um, text from COVID. It might be that um, it doesn't work very well because this domain transfer um, is not um, easy to solve. Um, but I mean, there are approaches, but it's just an additional challenge. Um, and moreover, while we have some research in this field um, on um, offensive and, and hateful language and toxic language, um, there is not yet so much research on um, mm -hmm. specifically yeah. on anti-Semitic speech. <laughs> so um, it is kind of new in, in this area. Um, so uh, we're kind of still at the beginning. Um, one thing we wanted to explore as part of this project is to see whether existing commercial services that tackle um, related concepts actually perform well on anti-Semitic speech. Um, there is one that is um, being used a lot in, um, in, in research, but also, um, also by um, content, uh, by, by media platforms like Reddit um, for content moderation, which is the so-called perspective API. Um, that has been developed by um, Jigsaw and the team by Google, team from Google. And um, basically, um, this tool uh, has certain so-called endpoints. So it computes different, you basically send a text to that tool and it produces scores for um, different concepts like toxicity, um, identity attack, um, threat, and so on. So basically the score um, is a number between um, zero and one, and um, I think it's lower by one. Um, and basically it, um, um, the higher the number, um, the more toxic, for instance, um, the text is, or um, the more, um, uh, the higher is the level of identity attack and so on. So for each of those concepts, you get um, a separate score um, for, the, um, for the text um, of interest. Um, and this definition of toxicity um, has certain overlaps um, with um, what has overlaps with certain forms of anti-Semitic speech. So they basically in that service, they define it in very broad terms and say that um, more or less toxic um, comments are those that um, might people um, might cause people leaving a discussion um, completely. So uh, offensive. So that much offensive that people would actually leave the discussion. Um, and identity attack is actually something that um, uh, relates a lot more to um, attacking um, people um, due to the fact that they uh, supposedly belong to a certain um, to a certain group. So what we wanted to see is how well actually that service can distinguish anti-Semitic speech from non-anti-Semitic speech. Because if it does well already, then that would be actually a positive sign, and we would know that you know um, organizations supplying this for content moderation. Mm -hmm. um, do actually discover anti-Semitic speech and are um, able to mitigate it um, in a faster way. Um, so what we saw is, uh, no, I don't see the numbers um, myself. So what we did is we took data from the project. Uh, we took three and a half thousand texts that were labeled as um, anti-Semitic and um, 53,000, approximately 53,000 texts um, labeled as not anti-Semitic. And then we basically sent it to the service and evaluated the scores that came back. Um, what we see in this um, in this graph, so you see, see a, like part of the plot. We wanted to see in particular, um, like, are the texts that were manually labeled as anti-Semitic are they more toxic? Are they more um, severely toxic? So this is another attribute that they have. Um, 
where um, the providers claim that um, the severe toxicity is actually even more robust in terms of um, it's not triggered by um, insults so much. Um, um, so this is also something that, that people tend to use, use in particular in research and um, identity attack was the, the third attribute that we found um, is certainly very relevant and has a lot of overlap with um, the concept of antisemitism. Um, so what we see in the graph is that the scores are uh, higher always for the texts that um, were labeled as anti-Semitic. So you don't see a legend here, but basically the higher scores, so the orange bars, um, that's a text that were labeled as anti-Semitic and the blue ones are those that were not labeled as, um, that were labeled as not anti-Semitic. And you see in particular um, um, a significant difference for um, the attribute of identity attack. So it, it shows that this service does pick up something that is contained in anti-Semitic texts. So it could, we cannot say for sure that it's the anti-Semitism that it picks up. So it could also be that one would have to explore that, that maybe in um, texts that were labeled as anti-Semitic, there is maybe also just more offensive language contained um, that triggers higher scores in this API. But um, at the same time, so we see that there is higher scores, but if we look at how high the scores actually are, then we see that they are not particularly um, high. So in, in research, uh, people consider the threshold of 0 0.5, and uh, many of them consider actually the threshold of 0 0.8, to be the relevant one. So everything with the score below 0 0.5 and in some cases basically even uh, below 0 0.8 is not really considered toxic or um, severely toxic or whatever. And if we would take the threshold of 0 0.5, then basically 75% um, of all texts that the team had labeled as anti-Semitic would, would fall below this threshold. So we do see that um, uh, those texts are rated in a different way by this um, by this service, but it would actually miss 75%, uh, if not more, um, of all the um, texts that were um, found to be anti-Semitic. So from this, we actually already can conclude that it's not really useful um, for this case. Um, and what we also did was to see, um, we tried to explore um, whether there is actually an influence by certain um, words, like um, words that are um, identity uh, related, like um, Jew or Jewishness or Israel. So we basically did an exploration. I won't go too much into details, and I can leave that for the Q&A. Um, but we basically looked at um, percentages of text that um, contain, so we looked at scores for text that contain those identity related words. Um, what we basically see is that um, if a text um, contains one of those identity-related words, then that uh, the probability is a lot higher to obtain a higher score, which means that uh, at the same time, we actually have a higher risk of so-called false positives, um, which is uh, quite dangerous for content moderation as well, meaning people are talking about um, a Jewishness or people are talking about the state of Israel, and um, that would trigger, um, that, that can trigger, or it has a higher probability to trigger a high score um, in this service. And um, if the content moderation is automated in a certain way, then it might actually um, yield, uh, yield uh, an automated exclusion of texts that actually just simply deal with this pattern, uh, with this topic. Um, right, so... Um, Starting from this, so basically uh, realizing that that service um, is not going to help and it's actually the main um, public commercial service available out there. Um, we um, looked in the project um, how well it actually works to train a custom model in, um, in a way that I um, described uh, a few slides before. So basically we take one of those pre-trained large language models that have learned a lot of um, statistical patterns about language from corpora like uh, Wikipedia, Google News, and so on and so on, and basically fine tuning them with the label data from the project to um, um, distinguish anti-Semitic posts from um, not anti-Semitic posts. And we um, restricted um, for the start to English language posts only, and we only try to distinguish um, the posts on this ideation level, so just anti-Semitism versus um, not uh, anti-Semitism. 
uh, we explicitly included uh, excluded those um, contextual um, so the posts that were labeled as contextually anti-Semitic because um, as long as the model um, does not know what the text um, actually refers to, it actually has a really little chance to um, detect um, the text itself as uh, contextually anti-Semitic. We have some ideas of how to tackle this, um, and I'm happy to talk about that in the Q&A. Um, and um, what we also have as an issue is that we have highly imbalanced classes so you've seen from the statistical evaluations um, before that Carolina presented that you have like around 10 to 15 percent of um, data that is being um, classified as anti-Semitic and a lot more data that is um, being labeled as not anti-Semitic. And this is always a challenging, um, a challenging thing for um, uh, for training models. So um, whenever you have that kind of imbalanced classes, the larger class uh, is easier to learn um, than the smaller class. And if you basically, so there are like different approaches how to handle imbalanced data, um, but they are all kind of um, imperfect um, um, to, to just like give you an idea. So this is really a tricky thing to do. And um, one would actually really need a lot, um, probably need a lot more data uh, belonging to, um, um, to the class of anti-Semitic texts. So we um, did this uh, type of fine tuning on different types of um, language models. And uh, sorry, I think my um, my computer is uh, needing in need of battery. Um, Matt, could you maybe share your screen? And I'm just gonna grab um, just gonna grab uh, um, my power supply. Would that be okay? Okay, just give me a second. I'm back in 10 seconds. I'm sorry. Apologies. I think we should uh, play some music or something. Or maybe not. There we go. <laughs> sorry about that. Okay, maybe you can, uh, do you want to continue sharing your screen? That um, would be great. I think I was uh, one before that. Right, exactly. So, um, so you can actually jump to the next one. So we basically, there are like different types of those large language models and there are different uh, parameters one can, um, one can play around with uh, before we start um, training, in fact. So we did, and um, the current model that we have, so keep in mind, we just took like the data from um, the English corpus and um, we only restricted to um, those posts that were um, considered only on their own could be labeled as anti-Semitic and those that considered on their own uh, could um, securely be labeled as not anti-Semitic. And um, so here, what you see, if you look at the, um, the second last column, the number of records, this shows you the performance performance in the so-called validation set and the test set. So this is like kind of data sets that you uh, put to the side in order to evaluate your model. And um, so you see that we have like um, almost 10 times as many um, data in this so-called class zero consisting of non-antisemitic texts. And um, the scores for that class are a lot better um, than for the other class. So which means that um, the model we have trained um, can very securely um, see that a text is um, not anti-Semitic, but it has uh, a lot of trouble. So a lot of trouble in, uh, in quotation marks. Uh, so we should keep uh, consider this actually in relative terms. Um, it does find... Um, oh. In, in this case, it would miss 35% of anti-Semitic posts, but at the same time, it would have a very low false alarm. So we would have to see like what consequences this would have in practice, because um, one thing that um, members from the team have discovered is that anti-Semitic posts come in uh, bundles. So when we have like a discussion in, in the news forum, then um, typically when we have like one anti-Semitic post, then there are in a reaction to this post, um, there will be more anti-Semitic posts. So 
um, it, it can well be that um, we are very well able, even with this model, to discover almost all of those um, concentrations of anti-Semitic sub-discussions. So this is, I think, something that will be interesting to explore. So this model currently would have a very low false alarm, but it wouldn't find um, all of, not nearly all of the anti-Semitic texts that we have in the corpus. One can actually move these thresholds, so I can um, I can make this so-called recall higher and uh, make sure that we actually detect more of anti-Semitic texts. But at the same time, in the current performance, um, it would actually mean that the false alarm would also be higher. So, um, so um, at this moment, basically, like I can I can like shift the two arrows against each other. Um, but it's also the question, like if you think about uh, content moderation, how many false alarms um, do you are you actually willing to um, willing to work with? So it can actually be um, actually quite uh, quite good to have a score of like seventy percent seventy percent recognition because uh, if you are a content moderator and you actually want to see like what's going on in a certain discussion, then um, that actually might be completely sufficient. Um, for a person to know, okay, this is something I should look into in more detail and see what's going on. Um, so, but these are actually initial results. So we have not um, we have not trained the model on. And you can maybe go to the next slide. And this is the things that we are um, working on right now. So we are basically feeding the model with more data, and we are quite confident that it will get um, significantly better when it sees more data. Um, there is more data in the English corpus, but um, also there is uh, data from the um, other corpora, like the French and the German one. And there are like different approaches how to handle multilingual data. There are multilingual language, multilingual language models. We can also work with automated um, translation. And this is something we will explore. Uh, we will, uh, at the same time, not only work on the further development of models, but actually spend um, some time in evaluating our current models so to see how well do they work in um, domain adaptation? So we will basically run them on new discourses and see how they perform there. And we are trying to understand the current ones in more details in um, terms of what are actually the so-called difficult positives. So what's the text that has been labeled as anti-Semitic, but the models are, are struggling a lot to um, detect them as such. Um, and I think this is something that is also very valuable insight from the, for the uh, annotators, because they can actually see um, what kind of language patterns um, are actually tricky for the current um, language models in terms of um, interpretation. Um, of course, right now, there is the whole discourse around um, GPT-based um, um, chat models and GPT-based models in, in general. So chat GPT is known um, by probably everyone here. Um, and there is current research uh, looking at um, possibilities of fine tuning those models. We are currently working on that as well. Um, and um, yes, yeah, so we are uh, confident that we'll have um, results on this um, towards the next and final um, discourse report. So that's our current uh, lines of research. And I think I'll stop here and uh, give over to Carolina and Matt. Uh, thanks, Helena, and thank you everyone for bearing with us. Very quickly, um, to sum up, um, also what, what we're um, working on now will make its way into a few publications. So first of all, the sixth discourse report uh, at the start of next year, uh, where we'll um, talk more about the ongoing qualitative analysis, but also the detection models. Um, and then Matt already mentioned the lexicon, which is almost ready. And we're also starting to work on an autology. And um, we are also preparing a series of online workshops to uh, sum up other, um, oh, sorry, our um, um, thoughts uh, from sort of gathered in the course of the project. And, and we've invited um, other experts to, to talk about their research and, and compare our and exchange on, on our uh, experiences. Details on that will be on our website soon. Uh, as well as all the reports uh, and, and all the other information. So um, please feel free to have a look. Thank you very much everyone for listening. And um, I think we're ready for the questions now.
Yes, so we have a few questions now. Um, and since we're a bit short in time, I will um, read some of them and I will summarize basically um, um, and, and group them together. Um, so one, so a few questions, a few pe people asked about the topic of distinction between anti-Semitism um, and criticism of Israel and, and comments addressing the, uh, the Palestinian uh, issue. So how, how does your model identify anti-Semitism, anti-Zionism, anti-Israeli sentiments, purely pro-Palestinian sentiments that are not anti-Semitic um, and so on? Um, I'll take this one quickly. So um, we do, and it, we 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 start from the IRA definition, um, which we essentially take as as saying that it is possible for you know uh, discourse around Israel to be anti-Semitic. Um, IRA does not say that all discourse around Israel is anti-Semitic. Um, so therefore, it becomes the task of you know d distinguishing the two. Um, we 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 definitely don't label anything that kind of talks about the Palestinian situation or particular events or you know automatically as, as anti-Semitic. Um, we're very careful to try and look at different ways in which it can be expressed. And one of the main kind of distinctions is one I mentioned earlier, which is th this notion of generalization or essentialization. Um, so if you're criticizing a particular incident, you're, you're, you're cr criticizing something that has some kind of concrete basis, you know, that there is, you know, an event has happened or there's a particular, uh, political faction in Israel or whatever, or, 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 or a, a, a particular event, something that's happened in the West Bank or Gaza. Um, if, if there's a concrete basis to that criticism, um, then we 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 would look at it carefully, but it would by by no means automatically be coded as um, anti-Semitic. If, however, the, a particular incident is kind of presented in in a completely uh, exaggerated, hugely exaggerated, essentializing way, so that that incident becomes a manifestation of some kind of uh, inherent Israeli evil or Jewish evil or it is used to kind of say that Israel has no right to exist at all as a state, um, then or that, that Israel is just, you know, deliberately targeting children and hospitals endlessly because of some kind of, you know, inherent drive to want to kill as many people as possible, that kind of thing we would then code as, um, code as anti-Semitic. Um, concepts like the apartheid analogy are you know they're controversial right they're controversial within the field of anti-semitism studies that essentially the apartheid analogy and bds is the the main uh difference between ira although ira doesn't actually mention either of those things but um ira and <laughs> the jerusalem declaration <laughs> of anti -Semitism. okay <laughs> um but that, that's the main but that's the main that's the main uh distinction and you know we through our analysis and we, we we kind of do take a position on that in which we would code uh, apartheid analogy as anti-Semitic and we can make a big argument about why we think it is um you know that the term was used long before Israel even came into existence it's been used you know Israel has been compared with apartheid long before 1967 um but methodologically there's no actual reason you could use the same method of qualitative analysis of, of data uh, followed by quantitative, you know, AI uh, um, use without necessarily relying on that particular concept. So if if there was a, you know, if there was a huge <laughs> controversy about it, um, that doesn't uh, delegitimize the 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 project as the project as a whole. But in general, we're extremely careful about just making the distinction between the two because it's very, it's, you know, it's hugely important that that space of you know legitimate criticism of Israel is is held open in in, in the same way as legitimate criticism of any other state is is held open. Um, right. Thank you. <clears throat> Another set of questions are more um, logistical, I think. So can you? Uh, and I'm reading the questions. Can you 
does it matter if somebody has a flow of comments? Um, so maybe a prolific writer will comment uh, again and again and again on, on the same post, maybe, uh, either himself or through various accounts, does it matter? And, and the second section of this question is, will, will you be able to detect where they are coming from, the comments? And thirdly, which is a logistical question, do you take into account other languages? Uh, maybe I'll try to take those three. So um, I think perhaps I can start with the, the, something that we haven't really talked about a lot uh, earlier. When we analyze a comment, we, we might see who posted it, but we don't focus on people's identity. We don't look into who they are. Um, how many followers they have or where they're from, even though sometimes, of course, we could make some assumption. And that, of course, makes things more complicated because, um, because um, yes, they could be bots. They could be from uh, perhaps from a, um, a, a different background um, to others. Um, and then the, the, our assumptions about, for example, what we, gave the, what we call the UK discourse or the French or German discourse um, are then slightly blurred but uh, our overarching aim is to uh, in the project is to or one of the aims is to reflect what this discourse looks like even with those influences so for example the fact that uh, uk comment sections are often uh, uh, can be can be an international place of, of debate that's part of the, the na nature of this discourse it, it also varies from um, event to event, because, for example, again, in the case of David Miller, I mentioned before, perhaps that was of interest more to uh, British people and, and um, that debate that was going on there about the party politics of the UK um, with, with specific, very specific country specific references will probably be um, not, uh, yeah, not, not visited by a lot of um, people, a lot of readers of UK outlets from other countries. But um, but to answer it, is, uh, it briefly, no, we don't look at, at the identity uh, of people. If we see a comment that uh, appears uh, sort of suspiciously often, and we think that might, for example, it's an anti-Semitic comment, and we think that it will affect our numbers, uh, we take it on, into account only once. That happened a few times that someone, either a bot or, or, a, or a very patient person posted the same thing again and again. Uh, we we then yeah don't take it into account each time um, because on the whole as Matt already hinted we try to um, annotate conservatively so whenever we we have a doubt we prefer to uh, not not to count something as anti-Semitic. Great, thank you. And we have another interesting question. Um, I think it will be one of the last questions because we're just short of time and. The question is, how did you an analyze toxicity and and um, less toxic um, and and less toxicity and give it points? Whether you use a software for analysis like sentiment analysis, mm -hmm. uh, kindly explain. And they referencing slide number thirty six. Um, I can uh, check which one that is, but I I guess it refers to the slide on perspective API. So the scores were not produced by us. We used this service uh, called Perspective API, which is a service meant to support content moderation uh, in online media. So basically it's a service where you send, um, so you send there a text. So a machine sends a text and gets an automated response, consisting of scores for those um, specific concepts like toxicity, identity attacks, severe toxicity, and so on. And we did that with the corpus, basically, so with a part of the corpus. We took um, data from different languages, German, French, English, um, those labeled as anti-Semitic, those labeled as not anti-Semitic, and basically analyzed the scores we got back from the service, um, figuring out that basically the largest uh, part of the content that has been labeled um, anti-Semitic would not pass a threshold which is considered a threshold, um, uh, which is considered a relevant threshold in practice. I hope that um, explains um, the slide. Um, thank you. I think it's about time to wrap up. So any last um, 
comments or notes from the speakers and uh, if not i think we'll we'll uh, say good night and good evening um uh, perhaps uh, just that um um yeah we are very sorry that we we are running out of time but uh, please feel free to get in touch with us via the website uh, have a look at the at the publications um hopefully they will clarify some of the things we haven't been able to do in person. Um, thank you. Uh, David, do you want to uh, close this uh, session? Uh, I will very formally. Um, I thought that was a really, really interesting uh, session, really interesting project, uh, really impressive um, presentations. Um, thank you very, very much.